When I started this video, my subject was going to be on the eight Doolittle Flyers who had been captured by the Japanese after they raided Tokyo in April of 1942. As I was doing my research, I came across more information about American POWs who had been shot down during the 44-45 air campaign against Japan. And the more the atrocities I read that the Japanese military uh, committed against these men, I, I had to step back. It was just barbaric. I, the cruelty of the Imperial Japanese Army was unbelievable. Okay, so anyways, even though it's been 76 years since these acts were committed, it still shocks the mind that one human being could do this to another. Four months after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle led a force of 16 B-25 bombers on a bombing mission to Japan. Now, the mission had two purposes. The first was to demonstrate that the United States Army Air Force could attack the home islands of Japan at its own pleasure, as well as to show the Japanese people that their leaders were lying to them about being able to secure the home islands. The second purpose was a morale booster for the United States. Basically, to paraphrase the old AT&T commercial, we reached out and touched them. However, that bombing mission did have consequences that would reverberate throughout the rest of the Pacific War. Now, the Japanese were embarrassed by the impact of the Doolittle Raid. In response, on July 13, 1942, the Japanese Vice Minister of War issued Military Secret Order 2190, quote, an enemy warplane crew did not violate wartime international laws, shall be treated as prisoners of war, and one who acted against said law shall be punished as a wartime capital crime. The Law Reports of Trials of War Criminals, Volume 5, page 3, 1948, said, a draft of a Japanese law concerning the punishment of the captured enemy airmen was sent from higher headquarters at Tokyo to the headquarters of the China Expeditionary Force in Nanking in July of 1942, and at the same time Tokyo requested the 13th Japanese Army Headquarters to defer its trial of the eight American flyers until the new military law had been enacted. Now, soon afterwards, the Supreme Commander at Nanking, General Hata, issued this Enemy Airmen's Act to the 13th Army. This law stated in substance that it should take effect on 13 August 1942 and be applied to all enemy airmen taking part in raids against Japanese territories, that anyone who should participate in the bombing or strafing of non-military targets or who, who should participate in any other violation of international law would be sentenced to death, which sentence might be commuted to life imprisonment or to a term of imprisonment not less than 10 years, and that imprisonment under the Act would be in accordance with the provisions of Japanese criminal law. Right. Now, the Enemy Airmen's Act had only three articles, which are published in the article when Mercy Seasons Justice, What Happens to Intermediate Actors in the Chain of Command. Now, if this was taken from Carol Galines, Fort Came Home, published by Van Norton, Princeton, 1966. Article 1. This law shall apply to all enemy airmen who raid the Japanese home island, Manchukuo, and the Japanese zones of military occupation, and who come within the areas under the jurisdiction of the China Expeditionary Force. Article 2. Any individual who commits any or all of the following shall be subject to military punishment. This is broken down into three sections. Section 1. The bombing, strafing, and otherwise attacking of civilians with the objective of cowing, intimidating, killing, or maiming them. Section 2. The bombing, strafing, or otherwise attacking of private properties whatsoever with the object with the objective of destroying or damaging same. Section 3, the bombing, strafing, or otherwise attacking of objectives other than those of military nature, except in those cases where such an act is unavoidable. Section 4, in addition to those acts covered in the pre preceding three sections, all other acts violating provisions of international law governing warfare Article 3, military punishment shall be the death penalty or life imprisonment or a term of imprisonment for not less than 10 years. 
Now, this military law shall be applicable to all acts committed prior to the date of its approval. The treatment of civilians in Japanese occupied areas had been well documented. They were guilty of the crimes from Section 1, attacking of civilians with objectives of cowing, intimidating, killing, or maiming them. Anyways, besides the law being ex post facto, I mean retroactively applying the law to the Doolittle Flyers, it flew in the face of the Geneva Convention and the treatment of captured enemy combatants. I mean, what were the results of the Doolittle Raid? Well, all 16 planes taking part in the raid crash landed in China. Only two crews were captured by the Japanese. Of these 10 men, eight survived. Two men, Bombardier Staff Sergeant William J. Dieter and Flight Engineer Sergeant Donald E. Fitzmaurice drowned when their B-25 crashed into the sea. The eight surviving crewmen were First Lieutenant D. E. Hallmark, First Lieutenant William G. Farrow, First Lieutenant Robert J. Matter, First Lieutenant Chase Nielsen, First Lieutenant Robert L. Height, Second Lieutenant George Barr, Corporal Harold A. Spatz, and Corporal Jacob DeShazer. Now, after being tortured and starved for months, all eight airmen were tried in a trial that made the Spanish Inquisition seem fair and unbalanced, and they were sentenced to death. Now, the Law Report of War Crimes Trial, Volume 5, stated, quote, After the trial, a telegram was sent to Tokyo through Nanking, announcing the sentences of the court, and later a written report was sent. Headquarters of the 13th Army had been instructed to withhold any action on the sentence until Tokyo acted on them. Later, instructions were received from Tokyo to execute three of the victims, including the prisoner who had been ill throughout the trial. The sentences passed on the other five were commuted to life imprisonment. Now, on October 15, 1942, Lieutenant Hallmark, Lieutenant Farrow, Corporal Spetzer were executed by firing squad. Lieutenant Nielsen, Lieutenant Height, Lieutenant Barr, and Lieutenant Meter, as well as Corporal Jacob DeShazer, were confined for the next 40 months in one Japanese prison after another. 36 of those months were in solitary confinement. Unfortunately, Robert Mater died December 1, 1943, from disease and starvation. Interestingly, though, after Mater's death, Nielsen, Height, and Barr, and DeShazer began receiving slightly better treatment and were even given a copy of the Bible and a few other books to read. Now, the treatment of these prisoners was against all civilized laws of warfare. However, for Allied airmen captured after them, the treatment would turn barbaric. The term barbaric can't even describe the treatment these POWs received. From November 1944 to the end of the war in the Pacific, August 1945, the U.S. Bomber Command in the Pacific conducted a bombing campaign that utterly destroyed factories, cities, anywhere in Japan. The campaign was so effective that General Curtis Lume said later in life to Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, if we had lost the war, we'd all have been persecuted as war criminals. Now, Lume's strategy was simple, kill enough of the enemy's military and civilian population until they quit. We may sent his B-29 bombers on low-altitude raids over Japan to implement his strategy of firebombing the home islands of Japan, and inevitably, air crews were shot down. Now, ever since the Enemy Airmen's Act was promulgated, Allied flyers shot down over Japanese-held territory faced a gruesome fate. These flyers included American, Australian, British, and all Commonwealth forces of the Allies. In August of 44. The Japanese government, realizing they would lose the war, issued the infamous Kill All Order, a copy of which can be found at mansell.com. Please see the link below. This was the order. When the battle situation becomes urgent, the POWs will be concentrated and confined in their location and kept under heavy guard until preparations for the final disposition will be made. Although the basic aim is to act under superior orders, Individual disposition may be made in certain circumstances, whether they are destroyed individually or groups, or whether it is accomplished by means of mass bombing, poisonous smoke, poison drowning, 
or decapitation, dispose of them as the situation dictates. It is the aim not to allow the escape of a single one, to annihilate them all, and not to leave any traces. This order was issued August 14, 1944, by the Ministry of War in Tokyo. In Gavin Dawes' book, Prisoners of the Japanese, he wrote about the treatment of Allied airmen shot down over Japan or in Japanese territory. At the Fukuoka, it was soldiers demonstrating swords, sword cuts and judo strikes, training civilians how to fight white invaders, showing how white men looked when they were shot with bows and arrows before they had their heads chopped off. For months, the Imperial Japanese Army at Osaka had been killing down air, American airmen, poisoning them, shooting them, chopping off their heads. The experience of POWs held by the Japanese was one of Inquisition barbarity. Only no confession was being sought. It was torture of American flyers by vivisection under the guise of science by qualified doctors. Quoting from Dawes book, Prisoners of the Japanese, the Western Japan Military Command gave some medical professors at the Kyushu Imperial University eight B-29 crewmen. The professors cut them up alive in a dirty room with a tin table where students dissected corpses. They drained the blood and replaced it with seawater. They cut out lungs, livers, and stomachs. They stopped blood flow in an artery near the heart to see how long death took. They dug holes in a skull and stuck a knife into the living brain to see what would happen. Now an article written by Thomas Easton of the Tokyo Bureau of the Baltimore Sun, which was published Sunday, May 28, 1995, described the story of American flyers shot down over Japan and what happened after their capture. On May 5, 1945, an American B-29 bomber was flying with a dozen other aircraft after bombing Takaharia Air Base in southwest Japan. Villages who witnessed the collision in the air saw about a dozen parachutes blossoming. At least nine were taken into custody. The authorities decided to make the prisoners available for medical experiments. And Kyushu University was willing to participate. Teddy J. Ponska was the first to be handed over to the doctors and their assistants. He had already been stabbed, either in his right shoulder or in his chest. He assumed he was about to be treated for his wounds when he was taken to an operating room. Panzeca's wound was enlarged. He wasn't anesthetized. He was then given intravenous interjections of seawater to determine if seawater could be used as a substitute for uh, sterilized saline solution. Panzeca bled to death. The eight other men were then used for experimentation also without any type of anesthesia. The Japanese wanted to learn whether a patient could survive the partial loss of his liver. They wanted to learn if epilepsy could be controlled by removing part of the brain. There were further intravenous injections of seawater, and every time the result was the same. All the Americans died. The remains of the soldiers were first preserved in formaldehyde, the better to study by anatomy students. There were second thoughts, though, when Japan surrendered to the United States in August of 45. All evidence of the experimentation on these men was destroyed. What the Japanese did to those American flyers was sadistic and barbaric. What they did to the POWs on the day that Japan surrendered was fiendish and hellish. There are not enough negative adjectives in the English language to describe what the Japanese did on that day. In an article for the Pacific Historical Review, Volume 68, November 1997, Number 4, page 487, titled, To Dispose of the Prisoners, the Japanese execution of American air crews at Fukuoka, Japan during 1945, written by Timothy Lang Francis, describes two events that happened on August 10, 1945 and August 15, 1945. This can be viewed at the website which will be posted in the description below. The trucks carrying eight Americans and 24 Japanese arrived near the Aburayama execution grounds early on the morning of August 10th. Four prisoners were killed by sword blows without completely severing their heads. One officer did not strike hard enough 
and while the Dave's flyer cheated on the edge of the pit, struck again. The second stroke went deep and the flyer fell into the pit. The fifth flyer was struck in the skull by 2nd Lieutenant Minigiro Ono and also died. Wacko counseled the probationary officer on the proper blow and a few moments later the second stroke cut quite deep and the flyer toppled into the pit. The next prisoner was led to a spot about five meters from the pit and was made to kneel. The officer, the officer was given a crossbow and fired twice, missing the flyer. The third arrow struck the prisoner, a glancing blow on the head. A fourth shot again missed. At this point, the demonstration of failure, the flyer was led to a pit. A newly arrived soldier was ordered to kill the flyer. The blow cut diagonally inward from the victim's shoulder. After this, the prisoner was still breathing. The Japanese officer had to resort to stabbing the American flyer in the heart. After a 10 minute break, it was decided the final prisoner was to be executed by karate. The flyer was first struck by two probationary officers. Several others, graduates of the Fatamata training school, also demonstrated blows, striking him with their fists and kicking him in the groin. Its E. Ono then ordered the demonstration stop. The flyer was led to the edge of the pit and an unidentified probation officer killed him with one blow to the neck. Five days later, Emperor Hirohito's recorded broadcast announcing the end of the war was played at 12 noon, Japanese time. Three hours later, at three o'clock in, in the afternoon, 17 American flyers were handcuffed, blindfolded, and thrown into a truck. By 3.30, they were at the Abu Rayama execution grounds. One by one, the prisoners were led to the different sites and made to sit with their legs extended out front. At one end of the field, the first prisoner was beheaded with two strokes of a sword. Behind a bamboo thicket, the shouts of another squad of soldiers were heard as they began executing their eight prisoners. Within minutes, all 17 American prisoners lay dead upon the ground. All had been killed by sword blows to the neck. They had been murdered in cold blood by a fanatical military hierarchy which had no concept of surrender. The last 17 Americans were murdered three and a half hours after Emperor Hirohito declared the war was over. One of the officers in charge even brought his girlfriend to watch this bestial event. Now, post-war investigations identified 30 Kyushu University doctors and military staff as war criminals. Five were convicted and sentenced to death. Four were convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. Not one of them was ever punished. Now, it was probably due to the realignment of the geopolitical forces that these men were dismissed for political expediency. War is barbaric, unfortunately. Mankind still has not learned its lesson, or should I say, world leaders. These young men were willing to sacrifice their life lives for a better peaceful world. I don't believe their sacrifice was in vain. However, I do believe we need to remember what happened to these young men and all the other human beings who were used in vivisection experiments by the Japanese during World War II. This was the other Holocaust. Well, I'm not going to ask if you liked or enjoyed this video or found it interesting. All I have to say is this is our history and this is our heritage. Well, thank you for watching. As, I, as always, please hit the like button, ring the bell, subscribe to my channel, and leave a comment below.